Hey, I'm Kayla Goldstein. I run the organization Questioning the Answers, where we ask a lot of questions and do research into sources to find the answers and apply them to our lives. It's all about living consciously, figuring out what God really wants from us, and living out our potential in life. So today I want to talk about Ishtadlis and faith during wartime. This is a talk that I gave over at a book fair and it went over really well and I got a lot of requests for my notes so I'm basically just putting it here so that I can easily share it. So I was asked to speak about Hishdadlis, which is like how much we try versus faith during wartime and what's the balance. And it was a question that was honestly very hard for me to talk about. It was very hard for me to write a speech about it because it's a difficult one, one that I'm going to anger a lot of people, but it's also because I had my own personal reservations and questions about this topic as well. Um, and what I did was I started by just writing down my questions, which is how I usually start. And I wrote down my three questions. They were number one, how much are we meant to take upon ourselves and do and expect from ourselves? Number two, how much do we leave up to Hashem? And number three is how do we keep the faith that God will protect us if this is the same God that allowed this to happen, right? It's really like the question that I feel like is in the back of everybody's mind right now. And it's a difficult question and it's a hard question. Um, so we're going to try to answer all three of those questions, really. So as you guys know, I'm a girl of the sources. I don't like just a nice idea. I like it to be shown to me on the inside with sources in the book so I can connect to it. So I went looking for a source about Ishtadlos, what it is and how much we should take upon ourselves. And this is what I found. So in Chumashmot, in Perak Yudalid, when the Jews are fleeing Mitzrayim, they're fleeing the Egyptians and they're trapped between the Yamsuf, the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army that's following them, right? And they sit down and they cry out to God and they cry out to Moshe and they, they say, were there not enough graves in Egypt? Like, why did you bring us here? We're going to die. And they start praying their heart out to God. Um, Hashem responds to them saying, why, why are you crying? Like, why are you davening to me? Stop davening, get up and go run into the water. And this is like a little bit difficult and it's a question that like most of the Mepharshim have is like why would Hashem not want their tefillah? Why did Hashem say why are you davening? Why are you crying? And Rashi explains that Hashem is saying that they, they shouldn't just be sitting there and crying. Like why are you just sitting there? Get up. Keep going. Keep running. Don't make yourself a target. Don't be a victim. Don't just sit there allowing yourself to be caught and cry. Get up and run. And then Hashem adds another point. He says, don't worry. Don't worry about the sea. You need to run from the Egyptians. You need to preserve your life. You need to run. Don't worry about the sea. I'm going to take care of that for you. You just go. And it seems that this is the source for literally the balance between how much effort we should put in. Hashem's telling you, get up and run. Our job is not to sit and cry. Our job is not to sit there and say, Hashem, please help us and not do anything for ourselves. Our job is to do what we need to do. Keep going. But when Hashem says to them, don't worry about the Yamsuf, I'm going to take care of it. Hashem is saying to them, your job is to try. My job is to ensure your success. Your job is to run. My job is to split the sea, is to clear your path. I'm going to do that. You need to have faith in me that I will ensure your success. But I can only ensure the success of something that you try to do. If you're just sitting there, I can't help your success because you're not trying. And it seems... Like the balance between Heshtadlis and faith isn't necessarily like I do this much and Hashem does the rest. It's more I do all of it, but knowing the whole time that whether I succeed or fail is up to Hashem and having faith that Hashem will make me succeed. So it's more about how we do our Heshtadlis than how much Heshtadlis versus how much is faith, right? But there's two more points here. First one is, is that the Sforno brings up this point he says Hashem yelled at the Jewish people get up and go but then he also yelled at Moshe why was Moshe even davening Moshe shouldn't have davened Moshe already told the Jewish people you will be successful Hashem is going to make you win Hashem is going to make you great he's promising all these things to the Jews and then he turns around and davens Hashem Hashem please save them so either he's lying to the Jews and he doesn't actually know that the Jews will be okay or He's just like joining the Jews when he's davening to Hashem. And Hashem's like, why are you, but why are you davening, right? 
And Moshe answers that, and this is according to the Sparno, that Moshe explains that Moshe knew that Hashem would destroy the Egyptians. And he even knew that Hashem destroyed the heir of Rav and all the Jews who like didn't, you know, join and leave. And he was worried that Hashem would not find merit to save these Jews because they were being disrespectful. They were saying, what, there weren't enough graves in, in, in Egypt? You had to bring us out to the desert to kill us? They were being disrespectful. So Moshe is davening to Hashem and saying, don't listen to them. Ignore what they're doing. Ignore this. Don't do this based on merit. Please just save them even though they're not worthy. And Hashem says to Moshe, why are you wasting time davening to me that I shouldn't think if they're worthy or not? You should not be thinking if they're worthy or not. Your job is to lead them out. Go lead them out. Go do your job. Don't stand here and pray to me that I should find them worthy. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. You're the one worried. Stop judging them and go. Have faith in me. And I think that this is such a beautiful point, even though it's a little bit of a tangent, because I think that a lot of times in the Jewish nation, without naming names, times, or circumstances, a lot of times when something negative happens, we we understand that Hashem does everything for a reason, and we search for the reason. And sometimes we assign blame on certain people, on certain actions, on certain things. And this is Hashem saying, this is not our place. Our place is to try to go and succeed, to have faith that Hashem will let us succeed. He is taking care of it. We do not have to worry. It's not our place. And I just think that that's such an important message. And it's such an important lesson for us. And even though it's a little bit of a tangent, I wanted to say it. The third point with this is struggles versus faith is something that I actually heard from my father. He spoke at an Agunah Asifa that we made in August, which was for a completely different topic, helping women get out of abusive marriages. And he spoke and he shared to the Agunah just a little bit of chizuk, how they could, you know, get through this difficult time. And he shared this idea of Ein Od Mavado, that Hashem, Ein Od Mavado means there's nothing besides for Hashem. Nothing. The whole entire world is Hashem. The internet that you are watching me on right now is Hashem. Like, I am Hashem. We are all the energy of Hashem, right? Like, it's like a projector that's beaming light. And the picture on the wall is really just made up of light. And that's like the world, right? Like, Hashem is like that light. And we are just an uh, tzimtzum, right? Like, we are uh, extraction of Hashem. We are all Hashem. Which means that anything can happen. Anything can change. And if we don't have it in us to give 100%, we give in 100% of what we have. But sometimes what we have is not 100% of what's needed. It's maybe 80%, maybe 2%, maybe 50%, right? It could be as much as it is. And en od mevado means that I'm going to give 100% of what I have, but I'm going to let Hashem be the rest. I'm going to mix and set myself, make myself, like, I'm, I'm going to say, Hashem, you take care of it. You do it. And I have had situations in my personal life where I have said, I'm done. Like angrily, disrespectfully, but I've been like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. Hashem, you take care of it. Like you want this, you do it. And he did. Every time. And it, every time was like shocking to me. It only happened to me three times because it's a pretty big thing. But every time it happened, right? We have this idea of we are going to give 100% of what we have. And we are going to have faith that Hashem will ensure the success of what we have. But we're also having faith that Hashem will do the rest that we don't have. That in old Malvado, that He's going to fill the vacuum. He's going to fill up the space that we don't have, of what we don't have. And He's going to complete us and therefore ensure our success, right? We have, we have Shimon and Levi who went out and killed the whole city of Shechem because of what they did to Dina. And Hashem ensured their success. So we understand that it's not necessarily about a balance. It's more about a mindset. We give 100% of what we have. We do it with the mindset that Hashem is ensuring our success and we pray and we know that Hashem will fill in whatever it is that we don't have. So in all of this, a question that I keep getting every time I share this is where does prayer come in? Like when do we dive in though? Like if we're doing, if we're busy doing our 100%, knowing that Hashem will take care of the rest, then why do people dive in? Why, why is sometimes people's 100% to dive in? Why do we say to Hillen, like why are we praying so much? Like, if we have faith and we know he's going to do it, like, why ask for it, right? It's almost disrespectful. It's almost like what the Jews did in the desert. But the thing is that we understand that we can change our destiny with davening. And that we have people in our history who have changed their 
they, their destiny, they have changed their trajectory of their path through prayer. And the most clear one is Leah. Leah Imenu was supposed to marry Esau. And she didn't want to marry Esau. He was not a good guy. She did not want to marry him. And she cried and cried and cried her whole life. And so much that she was ugly from crying. And she changed her destiny. How did she change her destiny? Hashem wasn't like, okay, fine. You can just like hitchhike onto Rachel and Yaakov's marriage. That's not what happened. What happened was is that Esau and Yaakov were supposed to be partners. And I learned this with my friend and I just think it's so beautiful. She said, Eitan, Esau, Eitan. Esav and Yaakov were supposed to be partners. Esav was supposed to be the warrior and Yaakov was supposed to be like the learner, the scholar. But Esav didn't do his part. And Leah was sitting here praying that she should marry Yaakov. So what happened? That warrior that Esav was supposed to do got transferred to Yaakov. When he stole the brachos, he, and he took that, that side, that warrior side of Esav. When he came and he was with Lavan and he dealt with Lavan, and it eventually culminated in him in fighting the angel of Esau. And that's when his name was changed because he was no longer Yaakov. He was Yisrael. He now had both. He was the Sal Ed, right? He was the both the warrior and the scholar. And he had both Leah and Rachel. And they each brought out a different part of him. She changed her destiny, Esau's destiny, and Yaakov's destiny, and the entire Jewish nation's destiny with her prayer. And that's how strong prayer can be. And that's why, even though we have faith that Hashem would, knows what's happening and ensures our success and has a plan, we always can pray that personally, for us, that plan not be painful. That that plan, either that we have the the chot, the strengths needed to do the plan, or that the plan be one that, we do, that doesn't hurt as much, that isn't as painful. So we definitely have this like idea of prayer and being able to change the destiny, the trajectory, or our own reserves of strength, right? But now comes to the, to the last question, which is, how do we maintain confidence in Hashem when, when He is the one who has brought this war upon us? He allowed all these terrorists to break the border, to come in and to commit the murders that they did and the horrible torture that they did. And He is even continuing to allow at the time of this recording, hopefully by the time it's posted, it's now no longer true, but he's even allowing hostages to stay in Gaza and continuously be tortured if they're not already dead, right? And after all is said and done, how, how do we trust him that he's going to ensure his success, that he cares about us at all if he's allowing these atrocities to happen, right? So... My answer is not pretty. It, it doesn't make a lot of people happy. And, and if you want to shut off the video now and just go with, with the first half, I totally understand. It resonated with me over my my traumas when I was experiencing heartnish, hardships and even when I like witnessed national hardships. So I'm going to share what resonated with me. Imagine a baby with a diaper rash, right? He's super uncomfortable, but he's okay. He's walking around, he's uncomfortable, but he's okay. But then his parents go, they take his diaper off and they deliberately hurt him. They deliberately touch the rash and, and, and like take a baby wipe and go on the rash. And it's not just uncomfortable anymore. The baby could be screaming in pain. And anybody who walks into the room and sees a parent causing pain to their child would like call CPS and this parent is deliberately causing pain to their child. So we're laughing because we know, we know the answer that it's not because they want to hurt the child or because they're even okay hurting the child. It's painful for them to hurt the child, but they are doing it because they know that not only will it get, it, it, not only will it not get better if they don't do it, but it will actually get worse. Like the parent is choosing to let the child feel pain now so that they don't feel more pain in the future. And we understand the context in that situation, so it's easy for us to understand. And But on a global scale, in a general sense, in a much less faulty way, God does the same thing with the world. And we, we don't have that context that we have when it comes to parenting. We don't have that context. We have the context when it comes to parenting. We have it, it can, it can be applied everywhere in life, right? I have a daughter who, who's allergic to gluten and when she was little, she did not understand why I didn't let her eat donuts on Hanukkah, but she, I, if I would have let her, she would have died. But now she understands and now it's okay. But back then she was really sad. She would be very angry. She would slam doors. She would call me the worst mother in the world. Nothing that she did would make me give her the donut. 
it's something that had to happen, right? Even if you take a surgeon in a in a operating room and you see an unconscious person on the table and he come, he's coming with a knife and he's cutting him open, like anybody walks in and be like, what the heck are you doing? But we know, we know that he's taking an illness out of this person, right? And it keeps it keeps on happening and we have examples throughout the world where it happens because it's giving us an idea of what's happening with God. We don't understand why he's doing what he's doing. And we don't understand why painful things have to happen, but we trust him and we have faith that he's doing it to to avoid bigger pain in the future, that it's necessary, it's a necessary evil. And at the same time, we pray that he find a different way, or we pray that he give us the kohot to handle it, or we pray that he ensure a success and we go and we do our absolute best and we know that Hashem going to do the rest and that's a magnet on my oven i do my best hashem does the rest this does not make what happened go away this is not even one iota this does not change the trauma that these people have to live with for the rest of like that as a nation we have to live with for the rest of our life it doesn't change anything except that if we can turn to hashem in the time of trouble in a time of pain it can comfort us a little bit so hopefully this gives us a way to turn to hashem and hopefully this hanukkah we will experience a full geula, and we will have Mashiach, and we will go to Israel, and we will light the menorah in the base of Mikdash, and everything will be okay. And I really, really hope that what I'm saying is true. I just hope that what I'm saying is true. <laughs>